Hello and welcome to class. It is a Friday and we have a lot of fun stuff for you today. Click the YouTube button below to make this video bigger. All right, so first of all, I apologize. It is one of those days that I have to film while Campbell is napping, so I can't be quite as vocal as I normally am. Um, but let's kick things off with some common sense. Hopefully you already know this one, boys and girls. Look both ways before crossing the street. Don't be like that guy. And boom. He's lucky he did not get ran over. So uh, I have one story. I'm sure you have plenty as well about this. But there was a kid in my grade who um, did not look both ways. Uh, one of, there, he was playing ball in the front yard and the ball went out on the street and he didn't even look. He just ran straight out to get it. And a car was coming, um, and even though the car wasn't going very fast, um, it ended up causing lifelong brain damage. And um, my friend ended up, for the rest of his life, uh, having some serious um, issues with, with headaches, and he wasn't able to remember a lot of things from his childhood. So uh, hopefully that lesson doesn't have to happen to you look both ways before crossing the street so you don't get hit by a car okay so i thought we would look at some decimals today so let me move myself up here for a second a decimal is a fraction with a base 10 denominator so you, yesterday we moved on to uh hundredths but we started off with the easiest decimal which is tenth Let's see if we can label all of our place values, all right? So look at my screen here. We've got the decimal point right here. So let's just go to the left first, all right? Let's go this way. So the very first place value right here, what is that? Correct. That's the ones place. How about... about my next place value? This one right here. Good, that's the tens place. Great job. And everybody, my last place value was over here. Ah. Good, that's a hundredths place. Hundreds. Alright, ends with a DS. So ones, tens, and hundreds. Now, let's go back to our decimal point. And I want us to go to the right. So the decimal point tells us that we are now working with a fraction. All right, we're now working with a number that is less than one. That's all the decimal point tells us. So this spot right here, the very first place is the tenths. And the second spot to the right of the decimal, as we talked about yesterday, is the hundredths. Great job. So um, one way that I like to think about decimals is in terms of money. Right? You see money um, everywhere. It, money is something that you have to deal with the rest of your life. So this is a really important skill to understand decimals because money and decimals are like brothers and sisters, okay? It's like best friends. So whenever you have money, let's just say, um, let's just say you've got uh, $1 and 24 cents. Let's look at this in terms of decimals, okay? One dollar, you can see I've got a dollar bill right here. Sorry, I locked in place. I've got one dollar bill right here. That's one hole. Then I've got a two in my tenths place. What coin is worth ten? 
guys, the dime, right? The dime is worth 10. So if I have a 2 in my 10s place, I need 1, 2. Okay. And now I can look at my hundredths. What coin do you need a hundred of to have one dollar? Good, a penny, right? So if I have four pennies, I'm going to have to So now I've got a dollar twenty four. So you notice here how my pennies are smaller than um, than my dime, but in real life pennies are bigger than a dime. Well, I wanted to show you the visual representation of a decimal. So let's look at my one whole. Look at my dollar bill. All right, how many tenths can you fit in a dollar bill? You can fit ten, right? See how I've got ten dimes? That's ten tenths. I'm going to write that fraction. 10 tenths equals one whole dollar. Okay? How many hundredths can I fit in a dollar? Think about how many pennies does it take to make a dollar? Yeah, look, I even did it. A hundred pennies can fit into one whole. So hundredths. You'd have 100 hundredths to equal one whole. Anything less than that is less than a dollar, correct? If you had 99 pennies, you'd have 99 cents, or as we'd say, 0 0.99. Okay. So, I can move that off the screen. Now, my dime, as I said, 10 of them can fit into a dollar. Each one is one tenth. So this dime is worth 0.1. This dime is worth 0.1. If I add 0.1 plus 0.1, I get 0.2, which is 20 cents. Would you agree that 2 tenths is worth 20? 2 times 10 is 20, right? 2 tenths, 20. All right. So now I can move on to my ones. Well, watch this. 10 pennies equals one dime, right? 10 cents equals 10 pennies. So each of these, one, two, three, and four. Each one of those is worth a hundredth. So point, not one, but point zero one. Because that tells me one out of a hundred. Zero one equals one hundred. So point zero one plus point zero one plus point zero one plus point zero one. Let's see if I can let's see if I can add those up. So I've got one, two, three, four. 0 0.04, which is equal to this, the four in the hundredths. So money, we always are working with tens, hundreds, which are decimals. All right, so we're going to do some more money examples here in a second. Um, I wanted to show you... Um, a model of a decimal using the fraction strips. So if this is equal to one whole, each yellow rod is worth one tenth. So one tenth and one tenth equals two tenths, right? Well, two tenths is a decimal is this, point two, which is right there, point two. All right, how about my red? 
it takes a hundred of them to equal one whole. So they're hundredths. So let me take my blue here and I've got one hundredth. I'm just going to clone that six times. One hundredth, one hundredth. So that is one, two, three, four, five, six hundredths. Six hundredths. So point not six, because this is my tenths. I said six hundredths, so I have to go all the way over to my hundredths place value. So I've got point zero six, which is this six right there. So what do I get if I take my point two? In my point zero six, and I combine them just like that, I get point two six, which happens to be right there. That's my decimal. Okay? And then you have to look how many holes do I have? Well, I've got one blue square, so I've got one hole. That's where this number comes in. One. 0.26. All right. So let's make another number. Let's do it. I'm going to take this and I'm going to clone it. Doing a little bit of on the fly teaching. This is a really, this is a challenging one. You know what? I'll just wait on that one. I'm just going to delete one of those. All right, I want you to tell me what number I have up on the screen. Okay, lock in your answers. Let's start with my biggest number which would be the biggest place value my blue squares each one is worth one if i've got one two see that i've got two of them one two so in blue i'm gonna write two then now i've got less than one to the right of the decimal point is less than one so i've got a decimal point and in yellow i'm gonna write my tens place how many tenths do i have one, two, three, four, five. So two point five. Now I need to count how many hundredths. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So my decimal is two point five nine. Let's use our word form to say it together. Okay, replace the point with an and. Everyone, two and fifty nine hundredths. So if I wanted to rewrite this part, I could write it like this, because it is less than 1. It is a fraction. 59 hundredths. All right, let's do another. One more. Okay. Hopefully you all can see that. Okay, and all right, this one was me is meant to try to trick you, okay? So if you're like, Mr. R, this doesn't make sense, you know why. Go ahead and solve. Okay, 
Hopefully that's enough time here to lock in your answer. Start with the biggest. How many ones do I have? How many blue squares do I have? One, two, three, four. All right, so I've got four holes. Then I'm going to need my decimal point because I'm dealing with the decimal, or as you'd say, a fraction less than one. All right, how many tenths do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Four point eight. And how many hundreds do I have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. can't put a 10 in that place value, it won't fit. Can I regroup maybe? Well, if I do regroup, I'm going to take all these 10s, all 10 of them, and they're equal to, oh yeah, they're equal to another 10. So let me add one to my 8, so plus 1 to my 8. And now, instead of 4.8, I've got 4.9. All right, you see how I tried to trick you on that one? I, it's just like any other place value. Once you get to 10, you have to regroup. So 4.9. All right, so moving on. Let's look at our money again. Let's look at our money. I'm going to give you a picture, and I want you to tell me what my value is. And I'm sure this will be even easier than the last one. Okay. Go ahead. What's my value? All right, hopefully that was enough time for you. Let's count how many ones do I have. One, two, right? So two goes in my one dollar bill section. Now I'm dealing with less than a dollar. So I'm dealing with my decimal. All right, so let's count how many dimes or tenths do I have. I've got one, two, three. So three goes in my tenths. So I've got 30 cents right there. That's the three. And then I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pennies. So eight hundredths. So if I were to take three dimes and eight pennies, that would be 38 cents, right? Well, guess what? That's this right here. 0.38 is 38 cents. And I've got two holes, so 2.38. If we were saying it in money terms, we would say two dollars and 38 cents if i was not saying it in money terms i would say two and 38 hundredths all right very good you want to do one more money one okay we'll do one more money example all right and then we're gonna move on Let's see here. Hopefully you can see this. Um, this one will be a challenge. All right. Hint, there will be some regrouping in this one. All right, go ahead. Okay, remember, if you need more time, you can pause it right now, okay? I'm going to start with my largest place value. I've got dollar bills. So, one, two, three. Okay, 
Now, my tenths. What coin again? Was a tenth of a dollar? Correct, a dime. So I got one tenth, two tenths, three tenths, four tenths, five tenths. And which coin was worth one hundredth? Yeah, a penny, right? Takes a hundred of them. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. All right, 3.516. I'm done, right? Wrong. I have to regroup. Silly Mr. R. You can only have up to 9 in the place value. So, let's see. Let's go back to my pennies. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Let me take those pennies I need to take all those pen all these pennies whoops oh, there's got to be an easy way for me to do this and, sorry boys and girls I need to take and exchange it for a dime. So let's do that. I'm exchanging it for a dime. So now, instead of having five, I have six dimes. So six tenths. And then, let's count my ones. One, two, three, four, five, six. So now I've fixed it. I've got three dollars and 66 cents. If I were to get rid of my decimal or my money sign, I could say 3.66. Or I could say in word form, three and 66 hundredths. That's what this is worth. It's worth 66 hundredths of a dollar. 66 cents. All right, great job. Yesterday, I showed you a video of some of the major battles of World War II, including the Battle of Britain, which was a question on yesterday's Google form. The Battle of Britain was fought in the air. It was the first major battle to be completely fought by planes. And the British defeated the Germans to keep the Nazis from taking over. Okay, so do you remember what happened that caused the United States to get into the war? Hint, think Japan. Correct. Pearl Harbor, right? The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. And this really, pardon my French, ticked off America to, to the point where we declared war. And there's a famous line by Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the president at the time. He's known as FDR a lot, oftentimes. He said uh, on the day of Pearl Harbor at night when he came on the TV, he said, uh, December 7th, 1941 is a day that will live in infamy. And what he means by that is it'll never be forgotten because of how horrible it was for Americans. Now, September 11th, 2001 was a very similar loss that um, both Pearl Harbor and 9-11, uh, uh, the United States lost over 2,000 people. So they're both terrible events that really, um, both of them, caused the United States to enter war. Okay, so Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, right? USA declares war on Japan and on Germany, since Japan and Germany were allies. So what happens after that? Well, for the next four years, from 1941 to 1945, the US fights both those sides. And there's a lot of times during the war, war that it looked like we were going to lose, all right? Um, you have to give the Nazis and the Japanese credit 
they were very, very good. Um, they were very good enemies. They did not make things easy. And uh, let me just highlight a couple things, okay? Um, let's talk about the Japanese first. So the United States was kind of getting its butt kicked by Japan. All right, think Pearl Harbor, they snuck up on us, hit us right in our own backyard. And then the Japanese um, had a bunch of really good uh, naval carriers, which are like the huge ships that can shoot uh, missiles and planes can come off of them. And so the Japanese were kind of kicking our butts um, until this one battle, right? There's this little tiny island that's for all our for our purpose sake, let's just say it was like halfway between um, Hawaii, which is the United States, and Japan. Right? A really crucial strip of land. Think about it. All these little islands become really important because that's where planes can land and refuel. Right? Anyway, this little island is called Midway. And there's a huge, huge, huge battle that happens at Midway um, where the Japanese basically... The Japanese basically uh, blew it. They should have won, um, but the United States, through some trickery and mainly through incredible courage and bravery, ends up defeating the Japanese, and we ended up sinking, I think it was three or four of their giant naval carriers, like the big ships. Um, so imagine if you're playing the game Battleship. You know how you have that big five-piece one? That would be, that's the, the five-piece ship. Um, would be what the United States sunk of the Japanese, a, a bunch of them. And uh, this was the devastating blow, all right? This would be like if you're in a sword fight and you lost your arm, okay? Yes, you're still alive, but you're so badly wounded, you, you don't really have a chance at winning, all right? That's what the United States did at the Battle of Midway, it turned the tide of the war. Okay, so we are we're starting to win. We're pushing and pushing and pushing. We're getting really close to Japan, all right? Why aren't the Japanese surrendering? We're killing a lot of their, their troops. Well, the Japanese had this really strong belief that they would never, ever, ever give up. They would literally kill themselves before giving up. I'm not, I'm not even kidding. I mean, literally, they would stab themselves in the heart and kill themselves before surrendering. And... The Japanese, um, they had an emperor, and the emperor basically told them all, like, hey, kids, women, we're going to train you to fight too. All right? So kids at recess would be learning how to sword fight and all kinds of crazy stuff like that. Can you imagine? And um, the United States was like, okay, well, we don't really have much of an option here. We're going to have to invade Japan, which is not good for us, right? Um, imagine if someone came to your house and was attacking you. You would know all the good hiding spots, right? You would be able to, you know um, your house better than anyone else, okay? That's called home field advantage, and the Japanese would have had it. They'd be able to hide, and they'd be able to sneak up on us, and... It would be really, really hard to defeat the Japanese in Japan. So, rather than risking hundreds of thousands of American lives, the president at the time, um, who took over for FDR when FDR died, his name is Harry Truman. And Truman decided he was going to use a secret weapon, a weapon that no one had ever used before. That weapon is, to this day, the most deadly weapon that there is, right? He used what we call an atomic bomb. An atomic bomb is a nuclear bomb. You've heard the word nuclear before, I'm sure. And... Truman decided, rather than, than risk hundreds of thousands of American lives, he was going to drop not one, but two atomic bombs on 
Japan, all right, right in their major cities. And hopefully it would kill so many people that the Japanese would have no choice but to surrender. And to Truman's credit, all right, even though there's a lot of disagreement among historians on whether what he did was right or wrong, you could argue that he was right to drop the bombs because after he did, the Japanese did surrender. Okay? He dropped a bomb on Hiroshima and on Nagasaki, two major Japanese cities. Um, and in a matter of a split second, he killed over 200,000 people, like instantly. Like the people literally just disintegrated. That's how powerful the bomb was. Bones and all just vanished, gone. So powerful. And uh, it worked. I mean, it saved hundreds of thousands of lives, American lives, um, and it did it did its job. It got the Japanese to surrender. Um, whether or not you agree or disagree that he should that he shouldn't have used the nuclear bomb, um, you can't deny that if he didn't, World War II would have lasted a lot longer, and it would have killed a lot more Americans. So. Um, that is the only time in all of history, not just the United States, but world history, that one country dropped an atomic bomb on another country. The only time. You've probably heard talk about nukes and stuff. Well, nuking another country um, is what we did to Japan. And since then, no one has done it because of how devastating it was. Uh, not only did it kill all those Japanese instantly, but nuclear bombs leave what we call radiation. And radiation is what causes cancer, radioactive waves. And so um, millions of people ended up dying after the bombs in the years to come of uh, nuclear fallout, which is radiation poisoning and cancer from the bomb that's why no one nukes anyone these days because it's just too powerful um, you might hear talk about us trying to stop other countries from getting nuclear weapons because of how powerful they are for instance north korea right under kim jong-un the evil dictator north koreans are trying like crazy to build as many nukes as they possibly can um, because it makes them dangerous. And the United States can't just go in and invade North Korea um, because they threaten to nuke other countries if we do. So <laughs> I know, right? World War II, so many things, not just the fighting, but other things like technology and nuclear bombs. At the end of the war, um, or after J Japan surrendered, it was the end of World War II. Um, a few months earlier, Germany surrendered, uh, and it wasn't nearly as explosive of an ending. It was more of the United States had finally broken through, and the Nazis kind of, um, they didn't have enough men left to defend Germany, and we ended up breaking through and kind of liberating Germany, um, saving the Jews that were in all those concentration camps. So let's look at some numbers here. Over 400,000 American soldiers died in World War II. And another 600,000 were wounded. So let's add those up. 400,000 plus 600,000 equals 1 million people were either dead or wounded at the end of the war. The war advented the use of chemicals, air fights, nuclear weapons, already mentioned this, the USA dropped two atom bombs on Japan. Thankfully, good defeated evil, or else we might live in the United States of Nazism. All right, so let's look at some pictures here. If it works. Uh, it might not be working. Maybe we'll be able to do it next time. Um, but here is a really just sad picture of what it looked like. These are all dead bodies um, after the nuclear bomb went off. These are all Japanese 
civilians dead from the atom bomb. Yeah, terrible to look at, I know, I'm sorry. It's the truth, though. World War II was incredibly devastating. Okay, so after World War II was over, all of Europe was pretty much destroyed, um, which meant that the United States kind of emerged as the savior um, for all these other countries. So uh, all the European countries that were destroyed, they had to f clean up and fix up their country. Well, if your country is destroyed, how are you going to get like steel and wood and all kinds of other supplies to rebuild things. What do you think? Where are you going to get those? Yeah, you're going to have to buy them off other people. You're going to have to go find someone who has it and then buy it. Well, guess whose country didn't really get hurt at all? Yeah, us, the United States. All our factories were still working great. So what we did was we loaned Europe a ton of money and we charged them a bunch of interest and we gave, we sold them all kinds of equipment and tools to rebuild all right so we ended up making a ton of money off world war ii which brought us out of the great depression and made us the most powerful country in the world all right so 1945 the end of world war ii the united states is officially the world's leading superpower and there's nobody that's really on our level except for one other country um, the only other country that's kind of even close to us is called the soviet union and the soviet union um, we now call russia all right so we'll get to that later um, that's called the cold war and that's coming up next but world war ii uh, makes us the world's leading superpower um, and we still are the world's leading superpower to this day so that was nearly that was 70 80 years ago almost um 75 years ago world war ii ended okay so let's move on to some trivia all right y'all ready for this it is friday so bust out those pennies those m m's those pretzels whatever you want and give yourself one if you get it right what holiday is this Sunday? Uh-huh, it's Mother's Day, and you better have a card ready to go for your mom. You can't cheat this year. Usually, your teacher helps you make something, but this year, because of the quarantine, you don't have that, so you need to make sure you set some time aside before Sunday to make your mom something, all right? Even if you make her breakfast on Sunday, all right? Do something for your mom. She brought you into this world and she deserves all the love and attention that you can give, okay? Give her a foot rub, I don't know. Um, ask if your mom wants her back scratched. <laughs> ask if you can help um, clean the dishes or fold the laundry, all right? Just be super, super kind to your mom because this Sunday is Mother's Day. Okie dokie. Next trivia question. What's the difference between annual and perennial flowers? If you know what the word annual means, you might be able to figure this out. Well, the difference is annual flowers bloom and then they die every year. They don't come back. Perennial flowers bloom and then they die and then they come back the next year. You don't have to buy a new one. You don't have to replant them, all right? So annuals grow in one season and then they're dead. Perennials live year after year after year. Okay, next question. Canada Dry, Verner's and Seagram's are all brands of what? The answer is ginger ale. They're all brands of ginger ale. And I am a big ginger ale fan. See this in the screen? Mmm, yummy. Okie dokie. Does the comma go after Mercer or PA when you're writing a letter?
goes after Mercer. Mercer PA one six one three seven. Okay, what animal species is Flash, the clerk at the driver center in the movie Zootopia? He's my favorite character. It's ironic his name is Flash because he is a three-toed sloth. He is the slowest animal. The sloth, or as plain earth guy would say, the sloth. Alright, finish the quote. Turn that frown upside down. Very good. Hopefully you got that one. All right, a silverback is a male what? What type of animal? A silverback. The answer is a male gorilla. A male gorilla. All right, next question. High school question. Although it was canceled this year, this high school dance happens at the end of the school year. For juniors and seniors, starts with the P. Go once, go on twice. Sold. The answer is prom. Next question. We're almost done here. Garfield's favorite food is. Everyone knows. If you've heard of Garfield, you know his favorite food is lasagna. Extra cheesy. All right, two more questions. What comes at the very end of the plot diagram? So let me draw it for you. It goes like this. It's like a roller coaster. Well, let's find out. We've got the introduction. We've got the rising action. The height of the story. It's called the climax, and then you've got the falling action, and the very last part, this is the answer, I'm going to draw it in green, this is the resolution, when everything gets wrapped up in the end, nice and neat. All right, let's do a couple questions. What language am I speaking? You ready? Uh, tu parles français. The answer is French. How about Aloha? Hawaiian. Um, sprechen Sie Deutsch? German. Um, Como estás? Tu hablas español? Si? O no? The answer is Spanish. Um, ciao. Ciao. Bellissimo. That is Italian. Let's see what else do I know. Okay, uh, how about this? Ni hao. Ni hao. That is Chinese. Ni hao is Chinese. Um, let's see. How about, oh, konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Japanese. Um, oh, I know another one. Hello is Anyang. Onion? That one is Korean. How about this one? Tesha uh, Kesha Darum. Tesha Kesha Darum. I'm pretty sure that means hello in Turkish. I know it's Turkish. I, I think it means hello. Let's see. Do I know any other ones? Oh, I think I'm all tapped out, folks. Um, yeah, that's all I, that's all I got. So anyway, I hope that you have a wonderful weekend and I hope you, um, stay warm. I heard it's supposed to be freezing cold this weekend, possibly snow. Let's hope not.
But uh, I love you guys. I miss you. And I will see you on Monday. Peace out, Girl Scouts. That means you, Michael.